we are live. Welcome to 2021's Antlers Review and Thoughts. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I liked a lot. I came close to loving. This video will have some jokes and I will get into some serious topics. And let's see the... Yeah, so... I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And yeah, I start the video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler. So you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. And as soon as I end the review itself, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for both movie and source material, and I will be discussing the ending. So, this movie is rated R, and so is the video. So yeah, the, the movie contains gruesome images and language, and I will talk about some of that in this video. And... So yeah, I have only watched this once, and I, you know, it's, I guess, five minutes since the end credits finished rolling on it. So, plot. In an isolated Oregon town, a middle school teacher and her sheriff brother become embroiled with her enigmatic student whose dark secrets lead to terrifying encounters. And... So, so yeah, on, you know, yeah, on Disney Plus, this, the, the suggested section has The Night House, Underwater, The Omen 2006, What Lies Beneath, Dark Water, the American one, Primeval, Grim Cuddy, and the 2006 The Hills Have Eyes. And I haven't watched any of those movies, so I can't really say if those are good comparisons or not. And, yeah, you know... I saw that this was on Disney Plus, and it seemed like something that would be interesting to talk about. And yeah, I'm glad that I decided to watch it and do this video. Now, let's see. So yeah, the the diversity is not amazing in this movie, and that is, you know. I feel like it's fair to expect diversity in films today and certainly like without spoilers without, without spoiling anything this does get into some Native American mythology and there's barely any Native Americans in the entire movie they they have the ones there are have very little screen time just, yeah, I really feel like that could have been, and, it, you know, I know some people are going to say, ah, well, in Oregon, there's not, Oregon, there isn't that much diversity, you know, it's mostly white people, there's still going to be at least some Native Americans, and if you're going to tackle a story, like, it just, at what point do we white people just feel like we've taken enough from Native Americans? with or, or native indigenous peoples in general before we're like oh hey maybe maybe if we're gonna tell their stories maybe a few of them should you know actually be part yeah now that brings us to the uh, right, I should just briefly say, some people, since this is on Disney+, Plus, you know, I, I'm not sure I saw it for this particular movie, but for some horror movies on Disney+, Plus, I, you know, in user reviews, you see people saying, you know, how can, how can a horror movie be on Disney+, Plus? Keep in mind, it is behind the age lock. You know, if you're in a place where it's possible that children and teenagers will try to watch something on Disney+, Plus, 
you can password protect this and anything else above a certain age rating. The same thing goes for, for example, the Netflix Marvel shows, which are for adults, even though most of what Disney has made that's MCU is for teenagers. So just, you know, don't don't worry about it if, you know, yeah, it's, it's, there's probably more young people sneaking into R-rated movies than there are managing to break the, the age lock on just, yeah. Like, you can, you can add a very difficult-to-crack password to the point where they're just going to be like, okay, screw it, let's, let's watch TikTok instead or something. Just, yeah. So, starting with the writing. Now, this was written... Let's see. Yeah, so, the screenplay was written by Henry Chason, Nick Antosca, and Scott Cooper. And Nick Antosca also wrote the short story that this is an adaptation of, which is called The Quiet Boy. Now, let's see. So Henry Chason has... Oh, that's right, yeah. Um, this is the only movie that he's written. He wrote two episodes of the TV series Servant. And, yeah, he... Let's see, he directed, edited composed for let's see yeah some some short films and yeah that is most of what he yeah and yeah when when it comes to Nick and Tosca you know it's important when you have someone who wrote you know tech just yeah Wrote, wrote something that was always only going to be text-based and got that published. Did they also write stuff that was filmed? And yeah, Nick and Tosca has written other stuff that was filmed before this. It's not only stuff that was, you know, tech, tech stuff that was published. Now, to be absolutely clear, I am not saying that it is easier. You know, good writing is not easy no matter what exactly it is you're writing. And I have the utmost respect for, you know, I, I used to read a lot of horror, also other stuff, but especially horror, you know, short stories and novels. It is, you know, there's there's serious craft that, that just, yeah. So it's not that I'm saying that it would be easier to, to only, but... They are very different mediums, you know, there are a lot of short stories that have been turned into movies, and like, I'd say probably at least 40% of them are just not good adaptations. Some of them are good movies, but I'd say at least 30% of them are also bad movies. And it's very, they're, they're just, they're very different mediums, you know. Now... Let's see, yeah, he has written... He has 11 TV writing credits. Yeah, he wrote a bunch of episodes of TV things. Wow, he wrote 24 episodes for th something called Channel Zero, which was is listed as a TV show. 12 episodes of Last Resort. <laughs> he wrote team, some, some Team Wolf episodes in the 2012 show. So, yeah, the... Yeah. And he has also written shorts. And yeah, yeah. before this, he wrote... He's, he's listed as the writer for the 2016 movie, The Forest. And he wrote the screenplay for the 2012, The Cottage. And yeah, it does seem like... I, I guess he has an interest in, in stuff that's out in nature. And honestly, based on this, I, I might try to track down some of the other things that he's... Yeah. And finally, we have Scott Cooper, who both wrote and directed. And let's see, he has directed six movies in total, including one that came out after this. I gotta say, I am not familiar with them. But yeah, after this, he directed The Pale Blue Eye this year. And he directed Hostiles in 2017, Black Mass 2015, Out of the Furnace 2013, and... 
the 2009 movie Crazy Heart, and he wrote seven movies, and let's see, oh, that's right, yeah, he actually, the, the, yeah, uh, the only movie that he has written that he hasn't directed is the upcoming A Head Full of Ghosts, which, you know, he wasn't listed as director for when I copied this in, and yeah. The the writing is pretty good, the and, and at times great. I... There are things that the movie hints at that's in the past, and we get, like, glimpses and, and brief, like, sometimes they'll talk a little bit about detail and such, and... It, it's the kind of thing where I think if they had spelled it out, I think it would have lost some of its power. And, you know, people who have suffered a lot of trauma are not necessarily super happy to talk about it with anyone other than, like, a therapist or, or during group therapy or something like that. So, you know, it can, it can feel very forced when you have a movie or a TV show or something and a character is just laying out all the details of the, the trauma that they've suffered. So, yeah, instead they imply about the, the trauma. And the, the characterization is, is good. Again, there's a lot implied without spelling things out. And the, the core concept is interesting and the way that they, you know, given that this is not a short story, you know, this, this is a feature film, they had to, you know, add more to, to the, the short story, which, uh, that sounds like I'm putting down the short story. I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is it doesn't feel like filler to me. Now, yeah, so, plot twists. I think an argument could be made that there are not that many things in this movie that you aren't going to see coming. I don't know that I would necessarily say it's the kind of thing of, like, the classical Greek tragedy, where you know things are going to go bad and you're basically powerless to stop it. It's, it's, it does basically have this thing of, you know, you, you can, you get the idea that thing, you know, something is going to go horribly wrong and you're, you're anticipating that and there's some, you know, there's some really effective horror stuff there, but... Yeah, this is not really a movie that to, to watch if, if plot twists are the most important thing to you. Now, direction. So yes, this was directed by Scott Cooper. And let's see. Right, in, in an interview, star Carrie Russell said that she's happy to be in horror movies after being in non-horror stuff for so many years. You know, th this is apparently not the first horror movie she's done. It's the only one I've seen. That Yeah, but, yeah, you know, for, I don't know, 20 years or something, she was, you know, acting in other stuff, and I'm, I'm really glad she's still acting, like, she still has serious talent, so, yeah. Now, let's see, so, I have some critic quotes. A lot of the movie feels very familiar, but the monster makes up for it, both the design and the build-up to it. Really dreary, it seems like everyone has some problem. See, I get why that would be negative for some people. I personally think that it is a very... Uh, I'm just gonna real quick note. There we go. So, I personally think it makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm, I'm not saying every movie should have, you know... Every major character has some problem. I think it makes a lot of sense for stuff for a genre like horror, because it is at the you know at the end of the day everything that is scary ultimately boils down to something. 
how do I say this without spoiling the movie? Um, something underlying, something, something that we are, something that can provoke anxiety when it doesn't lead to outright horror. You know, just things that we want to... <sighs> yeah, th things that, that can really get to you, you know. So, uh, yeah, I've always... I've, I've, I'm not saying that they're all bad, but I don't find it super interesting when you have a horror movie and basically things are fine until something bad happens. Like, it just doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me if the, the if there is no problem. I, I remember that was actually something, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago, so it stuck with me, evidently. Someone pointed out about Scream, just even the, the first Scream movie, the, the characters actually have problems before, like, the slasher starts. They, they pointed that out about the first Scream and also the first uh, I Know What You Did Last Summer, you know, which I know some people seem to hate that movie. I think it's perfectly fine. But yeah, the, the yeah, for a long time, slasher movies were about teenagers who had no real problems being attacked by a, a killer, and that was when it, when, for example, a movie like Scream, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to spoil anything, but if, you, if you've watched the first Scream movie, you know that the, at least some of the problems that are already going on for these characters, uh, yeah, the problems that these characters already have before the movie starts, some of that is actually, yeah, like the movie uses that to make it even scarier. And just, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, some some say worth the wait. And, yeah, uh, I, that is something I agree with. Some say tight beginnings, second half meanders, focusing on subtext. Yeah, that is, that is true. And, yeah, there is point out producer Del Toro is the monster movie guy. Some people felt it focused too much on Kerry Russell's character, Julia. It should focus on the kid, Lucas. And certainly, that would make a lot of sense. And it is... Yeah. I mean, it's not even the kind of thing where, you know, oh, let's you know spend a lot of time with the, you know, 20-year-old girl playing a 16-year-old. You know, um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly her age, but she's got to be in, like, her 30s or 40s, St you know, not saying, you know, she's still attractive, but it's, yeah, you know, it's, I think it's in the name value thing, she's more well-known, yeah, and, and, you know, to be clear, a woman has value beyond her looks, obviously. Now, uh, let's see, the, the film has its moments, but it never quite succeeds as a compelling family drama, nor is a frightening piece of elevated horror. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I can't really argue with that. And I'm not sure that I'd necessarily say, like, is this elevated horror? I guess... I think I see what they mean now. Yeah, f fair enough. But but yeah, it, it, it tries for that, doesn't completely succeed. A genuinely haunting horror movie which revels in the slightly suggested rather than the directly depicted. Very true. Russell imbues Julia with convincing traces of lingering trauma, but it's Lucas who rivets our attention. Not too bad, a couple of jump scares, but not the best scary movie I've seen. The indigenous theme seemed a bit mismanaged, and as a native man, believe me, I am accustomed to it. Yeah. To those who understand and know the truth about such places, the creature is the least scary thing about it. It's merely a form given to what everyone refuses to see until it can no longer be ignored, assuming there's anyone left. And that is very true. It's And that's definitely what the movie is like about and trying to say. Antlers is essentially misery tourism dressed up for Halloween. 
I really wish I could shoot that down, but yeah, I, I, yeah. And that is, that is probably my, you know, personally my biggest problem with the movie. A grim adult tale of trauma and poverty with solid, slightly underwhelmed performances by Russell and Jesse Plemons. Jerry T. Thomas is revelatory, and the creature designs are exquisite. The indigenous content, however, is incredibly frustrating. The obviousness of its messaging makes Antlers feel like an M. Night Shyamalan movie with all the fun parts removed. Antlers is the first horror flick from Cooper, and the filmmaking is efficiently creepy, if a bit grotesque. Let's see. Yeah. The camera lingers on bodies long enough for you to start squirming in your seat, and the sight of a de decomposed corpse will make you gasp out loud. Yeah. Cooper gives us an eco-horror tale in which the in which indigenous knowledge proves superior to mainstream skepticism. Uh, let's see. The film blows it with the slack-jawed lip service paid to Native American traditions. That is definitely a, a big problem for it. Yeah, yeah, I said, you know, misery tourism, that's one of my really big problems with it. And the the other biggest problem I have is, is definitely the Native, yeah, the way that it mishandles the Native American myth. Director Scott Cooper knows his way around characters that are scarred. Antlers is a creature feature that is bold, bloody, and full of symbolism. And let's see. A disappointing misfire that does, generally speaking, take itself far too seriously for its own good. I, I wouldn't quite agree with that, but that is how some people have felt and will feel. Antlers has something to say. It should have just spoken less and more eloquently. It's satisfyingly gross. Everyone is disappointed, depressed, and angry, which instantly sets Antlers on a course of being 90 minutes of misery porn. Let's see... A supernatural chiller that, though well-constructed, never quite connects its heavy themes to its creepy creature. Miserable in a way it never quite earns. And... Antlers is a three-star supernatural horror film with a five-star performance by 15-year-old American actor Jeremy T. Thomas. Who plays Lucas. And that is definitely true. A scary story of being traumatized by a monster and by reality. A gross-out gore festival that generates disgust more than fright. The real shock here is that credible Hollywood figures had anything to do with the sadistic stomach-churning crud. I can understand that perspective. I mean, I'm personally very... I've been watching horror movies... Let's see, I guess over two decades now. So I'm, you know, it, it takes a lot for me to be, like, grossed out. For sure, some people will feel that it goes too far. I personally do think, you know, it, it easily could have gone much further. Now... Antlers wants to be an overstuffed analogy for hot button issues first and a horror film second. Unfortunately, it can't seem to get either right. Even for a horror movie, the characters make terrible decisions. Reveals too much too soon. I honestly, I don't think there was that much of characters making. Like, we can tell, okay, that's a bad decision. But often the characters in the, the movie, like, based on what they know... You know, which is very different from what we know. Yeah, I, I, I'll grant that there's a little bit of that going on, but there's a lot less than I kind of expected from based on how much people. You know, some some people said it was just all over the place. Now, the opening of this movie, you immediately see how bad conditions are in the area. 
Now, I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. I think the ending of the movie is fine. It, like, certainly it's pretty well done. Yeah, you know, it's, um, yeah, no Deus Ex Machina, no other convenient writing. It is basically this, like, horror movies, it's extremely difficult to get a, a good ending. Like, you know, with a horror movie, it's almost the kind of thing where either you just start out, like, you come up with a brilliant ending, and you build to that. Or you have a good concept and then you have to figure out how to end the movie and maybe you do well, maybe you struggle, but yeah. And and uh, I would definitely say that when I, like the, the, the original short story, that really had me like stunned with the ending. And the movie itself, like, I thought it was good, I wasn't blown away, and yeah. So, talking briefly about the movie as an adaptation, I definitely recommend either reading or listening through the short story The Quiet Boy, written by Nick Antosca. It's definitely a 9 out of 10, and in most ways better than the, the film itself. Now... Uh, yeah, like like I mentioned earlier, I don't think that the movie really has filler. It definitely, like, it tries to flesh out some of what's in the short story and kind of add a few things that it can then also flesh out. I've, yeah, this is not one of those where it, like, feels like they don't know what to do, you know, they have a short story, and there's some parts that they definitely got to get in there, but they don't really know what else to, you know, they they had ideas here, and, and I think it might, part of it might be that Nick Antosca himself did help, you know, write the actual, I'm just very briefly gonna look up, I mean, I feel like, okay, it doesn't say here, here, based on his name, I can't help but wonder if he might actually be have have some Native American heritage. But but yeah, the you know the fact that he himself helped build it into a movie when very frequently you know that's another thing that like you know the original Hellraiser was also the you know. Clive Barker first wrote the short story, always intending to turn it into a movie, and once the short story was popular, you know, he went to the studio and said, I, I know how to turn the short story into a movie, money, you will make money, you know, and the, the, yeah, it, it's, you can, you can, you can sometimes really tell when it's the, the short story writer himself who, you know, comes into it, and he's like, I mean... Because if you've, if you've written stuff, you probably already know. So the, I'm saying this for, the, for anyone who hasn't tried writing. You, mo most you almost definitely have to remove at least some of what you would like to fit into what you've written because it just can't you can't quite get it to work you gotta kill your darlings so that's you know and so if someone tells you you want to make a longer version you know it's like oh well i mean maybe i can make some of the stuff work that i couldn't quite in the in the original short story so yeah let's let's try and you also see that sometimes with novel adaptations uh, you know i i've the first thing that comes to mind being if you compare the the Swedish I'm gonna go ahead and call it by its original name men who hate women and then the American the girl with the dragon tattoo both are based on the same original book but with the American you know it's it's not a remake of the Swedish one the the American one is a another adaptation of the book and like I I forget 
I think I read it once, but I forget if it is straight up like, I don't know if it's spe specifically David Fincher himself or, you know, but yeah, maybe someone watched the Swedish one, thought that's interesting, read the book and was like, why did they remove, why didn't they put this in the movie and decided to make a movie of their own to, to get, you know, so yeah. Now, let's see, I think that's all I'm going to say about the the short story before the spoiler section, so, but, but yeah, um, if you're at all interested, if, you know, unless you just hate reading books or listening to audiobooks, if you find the, the, this, you know, Native American horror story interesting, I, I definitely recommend the, the Quiet Boy. Now, that brings us to the characters. So, this stars Carrie Russell as Julia Meadows, and she's a teacher in this, I guess I'll just keep calling it... The, yeah, the... In this isolated Oregon town. So, in this town, she is the, the teacher for the... the Ah, uh, I, yeah, um, twelve-year-olds. She's she's teaching twelve-year-olds, and it seems like it is specifically like English literature because it you know you see you see her teaching class more than once, and she's talking about storytelling. And there's this one part where she's showing the the class this old movie that I'm not. I mean, it's not. I don't think it is Shakespeare, but it sounds like something in the, you know, yeah. So the the there's clearly something in her past, and occasionally, you know, it's she'll she'll talk some with her brother Paul, who's the sheriff, played by Jesse Plemons about the the trauma because they you know for some of their childhood and youth they grew up in the same house and i guess i won't give away yeah there's there was something there that you know and basically because julia herself has first-hand experience with child abuse she is very alert to the 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 signs the apparent signs of child abuse and that's basically why she gets as involved as she does now and and yeah, you know, both of them give strong performances. Like you can tell that there's some pain there, there's some trauma in their past, but it's not like overplayed. It's not it's, um, shouting matches, for example. You know, it's not it's not going for that Oscar gold. It's it's a bit more subdued. And again, like if you know people who have, you know, if either if you yourself have have experienced trauma or you know people who have, you know, yeah, it's not always shouting matches. Some people are just very quiet with it. You know, diff different people process trauma in different ways. Jeremy T. Thomas plays Lucas Weaver, who, you know, basically there's clearly something going on with him. And Julia just, you know, she wants to get to the bottom of it. She's It's basically this thing of, I can't let what happened to me happen to anyone else, you know, and, you know, it, it is also, you know, there's a, there's a debate to be had exactly how much teachers should get involved when they think that there's something going on, but this is a case where very clearly, you know, something has to be done. The, this is not... Something you can just... And Jeremy T. Thomas also just this very quiet performance. And he's got, you know, he's got these slouch shoulders. And he's, like, frequently looking down at the ground. 
and just his his face like he's he is incredibly convincing like just i i really hope that he, this this kid gets a career because this yeah i i would i would watch like this is this is like the first time i watched the road you know and and i'm very very glad that you know cuz cuz you know a number of child actors don't continue to act and and some of them don't want to continue acting into but the the i'm just going to cuz i cannot recall his name Cody Smith McPhee i'm really glad that he kept acting after you know he came of age you know let's see he yeah yeah he's from he's from 96 so he was like 12 or 13 when they made that movie and you know now he's let's see that i guess that makes him 26 if he yeah he had a birthday this year he's 26 now and he's just it's it's wild how talented he is you know re more recently i saw him in slow west and elvis and just yeah he's he's incredible he's not in a lot of elvis but slow west it's a it's a pretty big role and he's just phenomenal now and you know if he seems familiar you may have seen him in the x-men movies in the in the more recent x-men movies as nightcrawler but yeah i, I really hope jeremy t thomas continues acting um and and there are you know one one of the things like sometimes if someone is extremely convincing in a spe very specific role you know you you end up wondering is that just what they're like and there are times where he is you know different from that i'm not going to give away exactly what but he's not always slouching shoulders and and barely speaking and and this kind of thing so it it is legitimately he is you know capable of of other yeah and Graham Greene plays Warren Stokes, and let's see, it is, like, I don't know why Hollywood is so reluctant, well, yeah, probably because of the word that a bunch of people are just not going to care if it's all Native Americans, but, like, this, this guy is so talented, right, in Dances with Wolves, he does have a fairly substantial role see but but yeah just he's he's so unbelievably talented and yeah he really doesn't get very much it's 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 a fairly small role and he's i mean he is essentially there to explain the myth you know and i i guess they felt that it would be too ridiculous if they didn't at least have a native american retelling the myth you know it's not just i th i think we're i think we've all had our fill of horror movie characters googling the thing that's going on and just finding the answer there though of course i get you know it is also a trope something weird is going on let's find an expert and they'll lay it out exact like i wish that you know research was that easy that you just google you know scary creature looks like this and just immediately you get something that just tells you exactly what it is and you don't have to wade through a bunch of stuff that's you know not related and scroll past ads and and such but anyway yeah um i really i i definitely think he could be in in much more of this and i think i will Yeah, that's those are the ones that I'm going to get into. Now, that brings us to the dialogue, which I will say much of the time it's good. There is a little, you know, with with Julian Paul, who again, you know, they're they're siblings and yeah, it's it's not as bold to say the basically Paul stayed in the town. Julia moved away for a while, then came back, and, you know, she, she, yeah, she moved back to the town 
very recently and you know the kids are still getting adjusted to her as a teacher and you know she's she's living with Paul so there's a little bit of boundary stuff going on with the two of them you do get a little bit of expo you know exposition by way of people telling each other things that both of them already know a little bit of it is not justified you know there's there's literally one point where Julia points to someone and says who's that and Paul just responds oh well that's xyz don't you remember and she just goes yes i do and you know the acting is better than that i'm not i'm not Carrie russell i can't d deliver as good a performance as that but that is kind of what it boils down to and that's not great and it just yeah you know ideally you'll want to avoid that kind of but at its best and a lot of the time you know it's stuff like early on you know i've just told you that you know she came back you know many years later you know if you haven't watched my review and you watch the movie the movie kind of has to get that across and yeah like there's a point where julia says something like you know i barely recognize xyz and paul responds a lot can change in 20 years that's not bad because that is how people talk you know when when someone sees something for the first time in a lot of time in, in a long time they might say i barely recognize this and the other person might respond you know well a lot can change and, you know so that works but yeah and and i i don't i'm not going to claim that i necessarily have a great solution but i definitely think there are at least a little bit there, there's too many times in this movie where people say things like what is going on here what are we going to do and i know what this looks like but i get it i get why there's so much of that and i don't know i mean i guess ultimately Maybe there are just too many scenes where lines like that come up organically and the movie should have tried to maybe combine some of these scenes or maybe, yeah, you know, so, so it is, yeah. And this is, of course, eh, not of course, this is also one of those movies where because the, the main character has a personal relationship with someone who's law enforcement they kind of get to tag along sometimes and and do you know yeah in, investigate an area that the you know I, I don't think anybody even protested like no one was like was, she's not a cop that's just your sister dude just no just kind of yeah <laughs> and I get you know obviously Julia herself couldn't be a cop because then how would she get involved with the the this this kid you know what following him around or something just yeah not that she doesn't do that but she is his teacher you know that's that's how she gets into this whole yeah and he does specifically like verbally ask her not to so <laughs> yeah is that is that um What's what's the word? Lampshading, maybe? That they're call they're pointing out, yeah, we know. It's kinda creepy for, you know, thirty something single woman to be following around a twelve year old. But he called it out. He knows how creepy it is. Now, the cinematography was handled by DP Florian Hoffmeister, who has twenty two TV credits as DP and fourteen movie feature length credits as dp and yeah so based on his name it's not a huge surprise that some of his stuff is german he made a 2001 uh movie i guess called berlin is in germany you learn something new every day and he let's see 
Okay, well, okay, so yeah, he also did, I'm going to pronounce it Tar, I'm not 100% certain, because it has like an accent thing, but yeah, he also did that, which came out this year, and other than this, he, you know, he also did Johnny English Strikes Again, Mordecai, Okay, it's something called The Deep Blue Sea, but not Deep Blue Sea. Yeah, I, I don't know anything else that he's done, but he does a really good job here. There's some really, really... Like, a lot of the time... Yeah, I already mentioned there's a lot of build-up in this movie, and the build-up, that's... A lot of it is in the cinematography and the editing. And the, the cinematography... Like, he just... He crafts these shots that are just really really deeply compelling and just you know you you really want to see more of the you know and and that's that's important when the place itself is ugly and like barely you know the, the, yeah this is a very poorly kept area and yeah you know then then i mean you can you can go like super gritty and and just really focus on how okay uh never mind you can go really gritty and just focus on how how unpleasant it is or you can go a little bit more you know yeah i'm i'm really glad that they made the choice that they did here you know there's this shot from above where, you know, someone crosses police tape and goes in, and I was like, okay, this is, this is like noir, this is gorgeous, just, yeah, you know, a lot of, a lot of shots of nature, where it's looking kind of just, ah, what's the word, like, it is, um, It's, it's not particularly appealing, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's ugly without being unpleasant to look at as the viewer. And, you know, shots of, like, the, the town and the, the areas surrounding it. And, again, you get, like, it's, some of it is in a state of disrepair and just, it's, you know, the, you, you would not want to go here, which is, of course, also partially why it's misery tourism but yeah this was edited by dylan tikinor who also edited eternals which yeah he didn't yeah he's he's immensely talented holy crap okay so eternals lawless the town there will be blood brokeback mountain the royal tenenbaums unbreakable magnolia and boogie Nights. so yeah immensely talented and yeah like if if you know, Paul Thomas Anderson is a perfectionist. Using the same... So yeah, let's see, that's three Paul Thomas Anderson movies. And... Let's see, Ang Lee. Yeah, there's some immensely talented... Uh, yeah, just, just... It's, it's... And, and you can see that on... Uh, you can see that here as well. The, the editing... Is fairly rarely showy there's there's a little bit and it looked great so you know it, it is that kind of thing like if someone's gonna show off you want it to be you know dope as fuck but the the a lot of the time it is this very naturalistic it's not calling attention to itself and it like a lot of the time it kind of it's, it's not, I wouldn't use the word boring, but it does kind of have you feeling, the word isn't safe, but like the, the uh, you feel as though this is a place where fairly little happens and you don't, is it like, it's not that there's absolutely no danger, but it is just kind of you know, well, it's a place in America, it's fairly safe, you know, it's, you know, it's not that there's, like, 
nothing like you you do you know there there's there's some bullying going on and you know Paul as a sheriff sometimes has to deal with situations where like you know yeah sometimes he has to evict people who he really wishes he didn't have to evict and that kind of thing but it doesn't feel like oh there's a monster gonna attack you know so yeah there's a lot of horror movies that don't appreciate that if there's a it can it can be much more effective if there's a if there's a contrast between safety and danger now i was not able to find information on the budget but this had a box office of 35.7 million dollars and let's see yeah, you know, I can I can understand that. It's not it's not for everyone, but it definitely has an audience. And it was shot in Canada. Yeah. And they they got a lot, you know, there's there's some gorgeous nature in Canada. So, yeah, they they managed to get some and and it does look like Oregon. Oh, right, it's called Cispus Falls. That's the town name. And that brings us to the score. Now, the score was composed by Javier Navarrete, who has 39 credits for, for movies that he has composed for including Wrath of the Titans, Mirrors, Pan's Labyrinth, and The Devil's Backbone. So, yeah. Um, yeah, for those who might not know, Pan's Labyrinth and The Devil's Backbone were both directed by Guillermo del Toro, who is a producer on this. So, yeah. And, and you can understand why. Pan's Labyrinth has amazing score. You know, it's, it's in general... Yeah, there's a lot of great about that movie. And, yeah, you know, there's an hour, one and a half minutes of the score for free right here on YouTube. And, yeah, you know, it's worth listening through, you know, the very creepy, otherworldly builds tension really well. You know, and as usual, I would say don't listen to the music if you're not also going to watch the movie or, or if you buy the soundtrack or that kind of thing. Now, and yeah, so the sound design is amazing. Like, a lot of the time you hear the evil more than you see it, and the sound design really paints a picture in your head. Like, they spent a long time perfecting the sound design, and it is, like, holy crap. Like, the, the just sound, the... the there's this this sound that the you know that that is emitted from the the yeah and and you know sounds of gnashing of teeth and you know uh, squelching yeah very very yeah and let's see so, pacing. I was not bored, but, and I, I want to stress, I'm using the term as a descriptive, not a negative. I would call this movie slow. It has a lot of buildup and not that much payoff, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really say that I was unhappy with that, but I can understand the people who were. And it's definitely something to, to, you know, note if you're considering watching this. And, yeah, you know, I uh, I don't mind movies that don't move fast. So, but, but yeah, for sure, I get why some people maybe feel like, you know, the pace is more for the, the misery tourism aspect and doesn't necessarily work that well for the horror. 
And it is definitely a movie where you could kind of see how they could have... This could easily have been just a straight-up drama. Like, obviously, not like... Not now that it's shot. That You couldn't just re-edit it to a drama. Although, you could definitely... I, I'm not sure anyone has, but you could definitely re-edit... You could edit a drama trailer out of this. But the... Yeah. You know, and, and the, the horror aspect... Ultimately... Maybe it would benefit from the... I would, I would definitely say, I think, if they just... A straight adaptation of the short story would not have lasted feature length. It, I, If I had to guess, maybe half an hour or so. I think that probably would have been a more compelling viewing experience than this. N not necessarily, you know, I, I don't know that that would necessarily have been moving fast either. But if you're watching something that's kind of slow for half an hour, that's not as, you know, that's not the same as watching something that's slow for feature length. And this is kind of slow for feature length. And yeah, the, the things, like, I can see how the, especially, you know, when you when you look at, like, the, the screenplay, the way that for sure on the page i can see how they the the filmmakers feel like they've managed to connect the issues and the horror elements i don't think it completely works in the finished product now yeah so this is 94 minutes long without end credits and 101 and a half with and there really isn't like if if you watch the end credits it'll just be for the for the music and you know reading actually reading the credits maybe appreciating the font choice but there's you know there's nothing at the end of the credits the credits aren't especially visual you know just yeah and and I would definitely say, you know, sometimes you, you have a 90-minute movie and it's like, you, you could have fleshed this out a little bit more, made it, not, you know, made it two hours or more. This is definitely a case where it, it's not that... This is a case where they didn't really have material for more than these this 94 minute running time it's not the kind of thing where there's like chunks of the movie that's like wow that's just there because they knew they had to get it to 90 minutes but it is the kind of thing where you know i already mentioned when talking about dialogue you know there's maybe a few too many similar situations they're they're compelling to watch because of the acting and the the, the cinematography and editing, but I don't think the movie would lose a lot if you combined some of those scenes other than running time, and that's not fantastic. So, yeah. So, yeah, I would definitely say the best element of this is the social commentary. The worst aspect is this it's it's tied between the the way that it kind of uses native american culture without really like being that respectful of it or having a lot of native american characters that you know yeah that's one of the things and it's tied with the the misery tourism thing and, yeah, some people, you know, the, the worst things that others said about it were that it was underdeveloped. Some people felt it wasn't suspenseful. Now, the thing I was most worried about was that it would just be too obscure. And, yeah, the movie exceeded my expectations. And the thing I was definitely most looking forward to was more mythology from a culture that you don't see explored enough and 
yeah, like I mentioned, the movie did not... I, I wish it had treated the Native American culture with more respect. Now, the trailers do give away too much. There's a... Let's see, there's a teaser trailer which is... Uh, there we go. Yeah, so... There's a teaser trailer that is minute and a half, and then there's... Oh, right, there's at least three trailers. Yeah, the... Yeah, teaser trailer at a minute and a half, and a red band trailer at two and a half minutes. Both of those spoil at least a little bit too much. And it is the kind of thing where I don't know how you get audience interest without spoiling at least a little. And I would definitely say... If you like the trailers, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. The cover and poster don't give too much away. And it is, like... It's not the most... Ah, what's the word? I'm not sure that you necessarily get that much of an idea of what the movie's like based on the cover or poster. Now, when I searched uh, on YouTube for videos about this, I found three clips, the three trailers, 19 TV spots, including fan ones, eight minutes total, 10 review and analysis, three documentaries, and four reactions. So yeah, considering how recent this is, I really thought there would be more, but I guess not that many people really care too much about it, so yeah. Um, why is that there? There we go. And, yeah, Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 60% on the tomato meter based on 177 reviews and a 67% audience score based on over 500 verified ratings. The critics' consensus is it struggles to find a successful balance between its genre and allegorical elements, but Antlers is sharp enough to recommend as a richly atmospheric creature feature. And the audience says, Antlers can be a little heavy-handed, and it it isn't very scary. If you give this slow-burning story time to work, it'll get its hooks in you. I, I really feel like that depends on your definition of, of scary, but yeah. It's definitely not the most, like, the most recent horror movies, a lot of them go extremely far, you know, and the the... Yeah, this definitely doesn't go as far as a number of other scary movies or recent horror movies. So I think that might be why they say it isn't very scary. But yeah, anyway. Uh, so yeah, the the critics the the average rating was six point zero zero out of ten, and one hundred and six of one hundred and seventy seven reviews were fresh. Now, the audience, let's see, the average rating was 3.6 out of 5, and 67% of users gave it more than 3.5. And, yeah, it is fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, on Metacritic, it has a 57 out of 100 based on 33 critic reviews, and a user score of 5.8 out of 10 based on 65 ratings. Yeah, it's not that frequent these days that you see audience and critics agree so much, but yeah. Now, on IMDb, it... Let's see... Oh, did I not... Oh, well, the link is here anyway. I've... Oh, that's right. I, I meant to not copy it in. That's what I tell myself. So, there are only 472 IMDb user reviews, or 371 without spoilers, so, yeah, uh, let's see, I think I ended up reading all of the spoiler-free ones, and the, let's see, the, the, yeah, so the 100 top voted, 7 of them gave the movie 1 out of 10, 3 gave it 2 out of 10, 4 gave it 3 out of 10, 14 gave it 4 out of 10, 15 5 out of 10, 14 6 out of 10, 27 out of 10, 28 out of 10, 6 
9 out of 10 and 2 10 out of 10. So yeah, you know, people thought it was fairly average. And 102 of the 179 links in the IMDb external review section worked and were in English. Now, it won no awards, but it was awarded, uh, nominated for three. The Fangoria Chainsaw Awards for Best Supporting Performance by Jeremy T. Thomas, Best Creature Effects by Shane Mahan and Legacy Effects, and Best Horror Film for Hawaii Film Critics Society 2020. Now, the, yeah, so... 30.7% gave this 6 out of 10 in, in IMDb votes. 20.6 gave it 7 out of 10. 19.1 gave it 5 out of 10. 8.4 gave it 8. 8.0 gave it 4. 3.6 gave it 3. 3.5 gave it 10. 2.4 gave it 9. 2.1 gave it 1. 1.8 gave it 2. Yeah, I really wish that, that there was like a... That you had to just click, like, I thought it was too slow. I didn't think it was scary enough. I wonder why so many people voted so low and so high. Yeah. I will get to my rating very soon. Now, the special effects are quite good. And there's, um, there's some CG and some of the CG doesn't look completely amazing and it feels I, I can't say for sure but I think this didn't have the biggest budget in the world and yeah CG is one of those things where if you don't have enough money and time it's not gonna look amazing and you kind of have a choice of you know just letting it hang out there for everyone to see like Birdemic or trying to hide it as much as you can and a lot of the time this does hide it it doesn't show that much and there's some really great practical effects also there's some really great stunt work as well and yeah you know if if what you want out of this is gore and violence there's some really great stuff you know it, it will be too much for you know, don't make this the first horror movie you watch, but yeah, you know, if, if you, if part of your definition of a great horror movie is some really great gore and violence, this does deliver some, yeah, there's, there's not a, a huge amount of it, but there is a decent amount and it is all quite well done. Now, the... That brings us to... Right, so, yeah, I recommend this to fans of horror that uses mythology, especially Native American mythology. And, yeah, others who, like me, think that it makes a lot of sense for horror movies to be about people who already have problems you know it's not the the scary thing in the movie is not the only thing that is is there for you to really sink your teeth into now um i have not watched the special features on disney plus since i can't tell from the titles which ones are which ones have spoilers and like I mentioned, there's like five minutes between the end credits finishing and me hitting record. That's That was time I spent setting up the camera and everything. So, but the, the let's see. For sure, some of it is like behind the scenes kinds of stuff. Let's see if I can count together. So, seven, eleven... Ah, uh, that makes 17, 24, 28 minutes that seems like it's kind of behind-the-scenes stuff. 
I'm not sure all of it is s s purely for this movie, but, uh, you know, one of them is called An Exploration of Modern Horror with Guillermo del Toro, so that might be him discussing other things as well. And a 42-minute thing called Comic-Con at Home with Scott Cooper and Guillermo del Toro. Now, I... I probably will watch them after recording this video, and if there's something that's just absolutely amazing, maybe I'll add, like, a little bit of text about it in the in the description box of this video. Maybe I will record an additional video where I talk about it, but, yeah. I didn't want anything spoiled. So, yeah. According to Google, you can stream this on Disney+, Plus, Google Play, Via Play, and right here on YouTube. So, I rate this 7 mythological horrors out of 10. And I would definitely say that if it, if it had a better balance of the horror and these social, the, the social commentary, it could have gone higher like if we're just talking about like direction cinematography and editing this is like a 9 out of 10 but because some elements just don't completely yeah and I don't think yeah that is it so the rest of the video that's it for the review the rest of the video will contain spoilers so, I am not going to be spoiling anything other than the movie and the short story. So, yeah, the, the first, the, yeah, there are two sections. The notes taken while watching, which is, you know, the notes are in chrono chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching where... You know, basically when I found a critic quote that I was like, that's interesting, but I don't want to talk about it in the review because it kind of potentially spoils something. Yeah, so that brings us to notes taken while watching. So the Native American text opening, you know, kind of spells out what's going on with the monster. You know, I guess to set the tone, but yeah, it is like we, we like I said in the review in the, the direction section, did not mean for that to rhyme, but I did this time. This The movie definitely does show a lot very early, arguably too much too early. I do really appreciate we see Frank and Aiden before we see them in their monster forms. There are a lot of monster stories that don't do this, and really, like, I mean, okay, Frank is cooking meth, so not, you know, but it is, it, you know, he's not the most, you know, he doesn't contribute the most to society of absolutely everyone, but it is clear, like, this isn't really, it's not that they have ill intent, it's basically, this is the only way they can get by, you know. But, but yeah, the, the, we get just a little bit of time with Frank and Aiden before they start turning at all, and, yeah, like, it makes it more heartbreaking, because, you know, Aiden seems like a, a sweet kid, and Frank, like, He's not going to win father of the year for having, you know, I don't know, eight-year-old kid of his... Or, actually, I fair enough, it would be worse if the kid wasn't his. Sitting in the, in the truck, like, what is that, a hundred feet away from him cooking meth? Yeah, but, you know, he does care, and he's not like... Yeah, I really appreciate... We can tell that they like each other, and Frank is not physically abusive, at least. Again, like, it is technically a form of abuse to have, you know, a kid, you know, don't don't leave your kid unattended for, for the... And I get, you know, he said, we'll be right back, you know, which... 
he really did not know he was in a horror movie when he said that. The the but but yeah, you know, he's he's like like he he's he's being nice. He's smiling, you know, the and the kid likes him. The kid trusts him clearly. And let's see. Yeah, so Frank and the other guy in the mine hear strange noises. Ugh, I hate it when people come creeping around the meth lab. It's like, I told you, no freebies. For a few seconds, I thought they might actually show Aiden attacked, you know, Del Toro. We, we all know he screwed it up, screwed up enough that he would, uh, you know, and, and yes, he did only produce, but even so, like... Yeah. And, you know, Julia asks, does anyone have an, ex you know, she asks for class, does anyone have an example of a myth or a fairy tale? And, you know, Jasmine just like, you know, her hands, her, her hand shoots in the air. Like it is, there's a, there's a, There's a Tracy Flick energy there, but she doesn't seem as unhinged as as Tracy. So that's good at least. But but yeah, you know, clearly Jasmine is like the first to answer, you know, just yeah. And and Julia is like anyone at all. Does does anyone have a, you know, I cuz if you always let the the you know, the the smart kid answer every question then nobody else you know gets to participate in that way now let's see right and so yeah we see lucas kill a skunk to feed to frank and aiden or frayden for short which is both what they, you know, if you if you refer to both people at the same time, and what they cause in others. And let's see. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, Jess, nope, that's not his name. Jesse's the actor. His name is Paul. Paul talks about having to evict people he really doesn't want, you know, and he's like, you know, they get 10 to 15 minutes to grab what they can, throw it in the car. If they have a car, just, yeah. The, the, you know, this they could easily have turned this movie just into a drama about this, yeah. And Lucas reads his story in class, and it's no wonder that they thought it was so, you know, they put that, that's... That's in the teaser trailer as well, you know, the the entire just yeah. And the the uh what's the word? Like you know, and and he doesn't show the drawings to the others, but we the audience get to see them and just yikes. And Clint the bully attacks Lucas and Julia tries to call his house but gets no answer and you know I think in her mind she's taking Lucas out for ice cream but she's kind of just following a 12 year old around town I yeah like I said in the review that was yeah she's but and and I mean to be fair, I don't think the movie is saying that it's okay for her to be doing it. It's saying she needs to help, you know. And, you know, they have ice cream, and she says that ice cream is her favorite vegetable. If ice cream is a vegetable, what's your favorite fruit? And just, yeah. You know, this, she she is, like... The, uh, you want more teachers like that, you know, teachers who, who care and can, like, relate to the student outside of, of school this way, you know, if, if need be. Because, yeah, you know, he is clearly lonely. And, yeah, 
the that brings us to the yeah so you know ellen goes into you know because yeah um julia finds some real interesting reading material in lucas's desk and yeah i i did not get written down but it was something like how to hunt you know hu yeah hunting and let's see trapping and hunting i think it was called yeah ha <sighs> 12 year old at, at school looking into that's not is the best yeah you know i'm not saying that it's like you know if if that's the kind of if if it's a hobby that you want you know for you know a parent legal guardian to or you know like yeah i i guess uh scout i don't know scouts do that um but but that kind of thing but at school and having it as like a book in his desk that he you know yeah it's it's pretty clear he is himself hunting and trapping and just yeah you know can't count on running into a skunk every day and the let's see he also has like yeah yeah he has the 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 book that he's filling up with these horrifying drawings like credit to the art department because that really is like they did an incredible job on those and uh, you know just yeah i mean it's it's very clear from looking in his desk like there's some there's something really disturbing going on he's got these books that are about killing and and just like you know, worst of all, the Bible itself. But, yeah, so she goes to Ellen, and we have that thing of the, the you know, she's trying to get her, get, get Ellen to do something, and, yeah, she is, like, the, ah, what's the word? Uh, wait, did I know? Oh, that's right, that's, yeah. Right, I accidentally skipped. Yeah, so let's see. Yeah, the, the yeah before that there was when you know Julia is about to enter the you know the house of Lucas Frayden, but you know she hears some loud noises and leaves smartly and reassembles the drawing and. Her, her brother jump scares her because I guess someone felt there hadn't been a jump scare in enough time, just or, or a scare in enough time. Like we just had the the loud noises, and it's scary that she's assembling this. You know, yeah. Anyway, and yeah, Lucas cuts up some meat for Frayden, serves it. Frank snarls at him. Well, then prepare your own damn food. You can't expect him to be that much of a cook at age 12. And, yeah, Julia goes to Ellen, the principal, with the drawing, and they they talk about, you know, this looks like abuse, and it's this, like, slightly awkward dialogue where, you know, Ellen is like, well, neither of us are experts at diagnosing abuse, to which Julia responds, well, take it from... I, I, yeah, what well, even was the line, take it from, yeah, I think she does say take it from an expert on abuse or something like that, you know, let's see, and we see the corpse at the coroner's, and that's one of the things where it's like, you know, what did this, you know, there's bite marks, but I don't know any animal that could have done this, and it's just, I think there's a, Let's see, there's at least two different scenes where someone finds a dead body and is like, what is going on? What did this kind of thing? And it's just, I get it. You know, they have to, they have to get to feature length. But I don't think it was the most, like, you know, yeah. 
yeah, actually, yeah, I would say, you know, it's the kind of thing where it would have been more compelling if we only once saw someone and then maybe they find like several dead bodies in the in the same place or something you know and earlier you could maybe see maybe there was some blood left over from the body but someone uh, yeah i guess i i will grant lucas could not be dragging around adult human bodies even after frank is done with them now, there's this part where, like, ah, what was it? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. During the, the movie that's being shown, ah, I forget. I think it was a close-up of a face, but I forget if it was Julia, Lucas, or maybe both. But there's the, the, the flashing light because the projector is close to them. That was really very, like, creepy looking. And, yeah, Ellen goes to the uh, Frayed Weaver house, and the, the, um, I think this is one of the things where some people felt like, oh, wow, that was a stupid decision. Ellen goes all the way up to this door with multiple locks on it and opens it. Now, if you know that you're in a horror movie, that's a terrible decision to make. But let's please keep in mind, she's the school principal. She knows that there is supposed to be a younger child, you know, like an eight-year-old, that isn't enrolled in the school. You know, he's not. We know he exists, but he's, you know, we at the school haven't seen him and then she goes up and she you know from beyond this locked door she hears what is very clearly the cries of a small child opening the door is just like okay if you want to say she should have like called for for you know maybe the police to come and such you know i could i can understand you know there's there's maybe police procedure and such but would you really not open the locked door? Like, she thinks that the father is, like, torturing this kid. You know, like, the, the, that, that's, the, that's the logical conclusion to a locked door, padlock, not, not, ah, crap, not padlock, what's, what's the, the, not, yeah, the other kind of lock, you know. Multiple locks on this door, and hearing a small child crying from inside, you know, the, the logical conclusion is not Wendigo. Now, and yeah, after eating some of Ellen, Frank starts growing antlers from inside his mouth. Growth spurts can be a real pain. But yeah, that is also... I really appreciate I think there was only one scene where we saw someone being eaten by a Wendigo. And that was Ellen. So I really appreciate I I don't think it would have made the movie better if we saw that twice the way that we saw you know messed up bodies found multiple times and yeah and you know i, I don't think that everything in the movie is like i think it, it is mainly you know the the yeah the the multiple and uh, yeah the multiple times that we see julia considering buying liquor it would have been fine if you just did that once, you know. May, the it happens once at the very, very, very early in the movie, and then once a little bit later. I think they should have removed the early one, uh, you know, because then later it's like, oh, she is considering getting drunk because of the problems, and now she's, you know, but but having it multiple times, or or you could have had her actually go ahead and buy it that second time, but twice. Of her just looking at it and not buying, like, you know, she could have bought it, and then she comes home, and, you know, maybe her brother prevents her from drinking, or something like that, you know, but twice where she's just looking, you're not accomplishing anything, you know, but, but yeah, like, for example, uh, as much as I hate watching bullies in movies, yeah, I don't think that the bully was overexposed, and the, let's see... Yeah, I think maybe also, maybe too many scenes 
of Lucas going, you know, up, unlocking the door, putting in the food, and then either staying in there or going out, go, or, or leaving and locking it behind him. We didn't need to see that that many times either. Especially considering how much of the movie passes before the, you know, Frayden gets out of the, yeah. And Frank goes beast mode on Clint. I appreciate that we only get a short glimpse of Frank there. It's really only at the very, very end that we get a good look at Frank in his final form. Now, uh, yeah, so we get a... We, we see Lucas's flashback, and it was Frank who put the locks on. You know, that is the the... I hadn't thought about it until then, but yeah, like, a 12-year-old's gonna do that, and, you know, obviously, you wonder how did he, like, if he was, if his, if, if Frank's condition was deteriorating so fast that he could barely get the lock on, you know, how did he get, like, the, the, ah, what's the word, you know, how, how did he manage to get out and, and buy it, I figure, you know, he does have a car, he gets, to the store pretty quickly buys nothing but the the two locks gets back you know and and i i doubt that it's the first time he has to get like handy with tools in his life so yeah and let's see um yeah, that is something I already mentioned. Yeah, and we have Julia and Lucas at the place where Julia is staying. Like is also in the short story, and yeah, I I gotta say the the short story, you know that that is sometimes the case with with feature length adaptations of short stories. You know, you you get a they have to they have to have some other stuff you know and in this case a lot of it is fleshing stuff out and then you get the actual short story and it's i like the ending of the movie i i'm not necessarily saying that i think the ending of the short story would have been better for the movie but i do think you know it's it's one of those things where the the um, horror movie endings are difficult because we kind of we we need some closure you know something needs to happen that couldn't just have happened at the very start and i i um back when imdb had message boards someone pointed out on a horror movie that i can't mention what without spoiling the ending of that one, but they pointed out that horror movie endings can feel very flat if there isn't a, a, a fight between one of the heroes and the, the scary, you know, wh whatever exactly it is. So, yeah, they wanted to avoid the movie having no fight between, you know, but having the fight and then, like... I don't know, two minutes later or something, it's revealed, you know, um, Paul, Sheriff Paul, is starting to, to turn, you know, we see he's coughing up black, um, ah, what's it called? Like, um, yeah, you know, coughing up some, some kind of black substance, like Frank was before he turned, and you know, ultimately, Aiden doesn't become one of the one of the Wendigos. Only Frank does. But you know, we see earlier in the film, you know, uh, Lucas gets his brother some like chips or something, and he, you know, yeah, they they provoke a very negative reaction. To, you know, which was also like I appreciated. You know, instead of like literally having. Frank or Aiden say, it can only be meat, we can only eat meat or something, you know, no, it's, it's clear they can't eat regular stuff anymore, it has to be meat. But yeah, um, 
I get it if if it's a complete if it if it solves if it resolves everything then it can you know a horror movie ending can feel like well okay that's now I'm not scared anymore because everything was resolved you know it's super difficult but I do think that it was a tiny bit but would it maybe have been more interesting if Julia ah uh, Maybe if Julia herself turned, or if after you see him cough a, a little, you know, the, the, let's see, well, yeah, I mean, we know that it, let's see, you have to eat human flesh before you turn into the Wendigo. Yeah, yeah, like maybe, uh, let's see, um... Yes, so, you know, we see him coughing up, uh, let's see, yeah, he, he coughs up some, some black bile, and, you know, goes, you know, yeah, go, goes home, and then, like, maybe, um, I guess it, yeah, it takes some time to turn, doesn't it? Or wait, maybe... Actually, come to think of it, I'm not entirely sure it takes all that long. And and it could be mid... Yeah, yeah. so, you know, they get all the way home, and, like, yeah, maybe Paul says, you, you go ahead, I'll park the car, or something, you know, so Lucas... Yeah, Julia, Julia gets Lucas up to, you know, they have maybe a spare bed that he can sleep in, or something, and then you hear the, the horrible screeching again, and Julia, like, let's see, yeah, she's just, she's just put Lucas to bed. So she's, you know, she's still looking at him, hears the noise, turns around, and the camera is, like, behind her, so we see what she sees. And, you know, Paul is, like, part way through transforming, and maybe, like, rushes at her, and then it turns, then it goes black, or something like that. I just feel like it was, you, you can't have, like, a... a like it's a, it's an actual battle. Like she doesn't just like shove it in, you know, sh sh push it off a ledge or something. No, it's it's a battle, and then you just have this like, yeah, it almost it feels like maybe it was a studio note or something that they were like, maybe originally Paul died from the attack, and they were like, ah, you gotta have someone turning into the thing at the end. But but yeah, back to where they are at, you know, the place Julia is staying. When Lucas said, that was my old dad, that really gave me chills. And Julia responds like, what? Speak up, why are you always whispering? And, let's see, yeah, so we see Frank attack, and, you know, he kills one of the cops, he attacks, uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, um, yeah, I literally just said it. Paul, that's it. And we see little other than the antlers. But, but yeah, I, I really appreciate, you know, I mentioned we, also, we only have one scene of where we, you know, very clearly see, or no, not clearly see, but where clearly what is happening is that Frank is eating some of, of a human being, you know, with, with Ellen. And the, the sounds of, like, gnashing of teeth and, like, I don't know, I, I feel like there was at least one noise of, like, him breaking a bone with, one of her bones with his teeth. Just, that was really, really, very, very scary. And, and just, yeah. You need a doctor. Get you a doctor to bring you back to life. This is Julia Meadows. We need an ambulance. There's a cop here talking to plants. And Julia starts to walk down the mine. Lucas, does your family still need food? My brother's practically dead anyway. And she reaches the boys. We get our first good look at Frank in his final form. Love the skin of the face hanging on, even though he clearly isn't human anymore. And there's no doubt that that is what... And, and ah, let me think. I think that was also in the short story, that you could see where the face used to be, but clearly no longer a human being, you know. And I'm almost certain in the short story, Aiden was also a Wendigo. 
not gonna lie, I do think that could have made the movie even more, like, scary as a, just, if, if you saw, like, a child Wendigo, like, just, yeah. Although it is, of course, just, you know, yeah, I will talk about the, the violence towards him briefly. Um, but, but yeah, I didn't love, there's, like, a shot where, like, Frank peels off the skin. I felt that was a little too obviously CG. And, yeah, so, Julia stabs Frank. It's not a long fight, but I do appreciate that it is a fight. And... You know, after stabbing him, she stabs him some more, gets the heart out, because this is Guillermo del Toro producing. And Aiden screams, and Julia kills Aiden, because this is Guillermo del Toro producing. I really, you know, I wonder how long the discussion was before Guillermo del Toro agreed, okay, fine, we won't see Aiden get stabbed, we'll just see Julia go up to him, apologize, and then the implication will be strong enough. Because you know he wanted... He, he wanted that kind of just... Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and, you know, Paul starts coughing and says, I'll catch up to you. Just gotta end the movie on the note that it's not over. And I think... I will go ahead and talk more about the short story here. So basically, you know, I've already spoiled it. So hopefully you did already read it or listen through the audiobook because it really is amazing. But yeah, basically, you know, it's this thing of she, Julia, you know, wants to try to reach Lucas, and she's worried that he's malnourished and such, and, you know, something, I, I get why they couldn't get it into the movie, it, it would have felt really forced and awkward, but in the short story, they, you know, specifically, it's, it's a first-person account, almost the entire story, it's a first-person account, Julia telling us, you know, and she specifically notes that he smells like uh, an animal, you know, and she wonders, oh, maybe maybe they have a, a dog or a cat at home. And she asks him, and he says, no, no, no pets. And, you know, later, the, the like, I think it's, yeah, cops or something find, like, a huge, like, a, just a ton of, of killed animals with the flesh removed and such. And she thinks back to, he always smells like an animal, like, you know, oh, that's why he smells like an animal, because he spends all of his spare time cutting up animals, and just, yeah, and, and the, yeah, you know, the, the, Julia only encounters, you know, where, where the movie shows us the, the, you know, Frank and Aiden many times, and from early on, you know, in the in the short story, it really is only at the very end that Julia directly, you know, encounters them. And, yeah, you know, they, they kill her, and it's not described... The, the killing the, itself is not described, but it's described how, like, a while later they find her body there. And, you know, just... Yeah, the, the short story is really, really excellent. Very, very scary, and... Yeah, um, I'm not saying that necessarily the the sh the movie should have ended at the at the house with you know Julia getting killed. You know, I I 100. I really appreciate movies horror, horror movies where the the female lead or a major character survives and in fact you know like is the case here manages to kill the the evil thing you know not just you know helplessly screaming and running scared and and such now let's see that is it for that section so on to the last section which is entitled notes taken before watching so I would like a spiritual successor to this. Um, obviously, you know, I, I would hope that 
they get the the balance a little better um yeah i think that is about what i have to say about that so that brings us to let's see oh that's right yeah the the so yeah in the short story um they find dead bodies thinking that it's frank and aiden and that's right yeah julia learns that the basement of the house where frank lucas and aiden stayed was full of dead animals wrung like towels some of them had only been there for days that's what lucas smelt of and she wonders if he did it and the sheriff says on the phone people were killed some kind of animals gotten loose we don't know where it is now her neighbor is attacked and oh that's right in the in the short story it's todd not aiden and yeah both of the wendigo are outside the voice asks for lucas but julia won't give him up and that's also like the voice is really messed up I don't mind that Frank doesn't n no longer speaks, you know, in in the final Wendigo form. I I do think, I think it might have been okay if the they basically didn't speak after the very very first scene before they're attacked. Let's see, and oh, that's right, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. The Lucas says they don't like light. Lucas Julia try, gives Lucas back. Wants to leave teaching, but is killed. And we're told about her dead body. Now, the... Let's see. I'm not sure the opioid crisis commentary was in the short story. I might have missed it. It does mental parental abuse. Julia thinks maybe Frank is an alcoholic, and thus Lucas is taking care of Frank rather than the other way around. I don't think there was any hint that Julia herself had trauma in her past. But, yeah... Certainly, the, the you know, it makes the movie more interesting that she is one of the traumatized people. Let's see. So, I have some credit quotes. I realize this may have been okay in the 80s, but today it feels tone deaf to have a white woman go and get involved in the problems of the natives instead of dealing with her own. Very true. At one point, they meet a character who just knows everything about the creature, including how to kill it. He just opens a book, points to stuff. This is a horror movie trope that really needs to die. The movie had given enough information up to that point. We didn't need it spelled out. You'll either know based on the movie or you'll look it up afterwards. The Wendigo is the Earth's way of getting revenge on people for ruining the Earth. So, the... Yeah, the Wendigo is a metaphor for the... Right. Those were all the credit quotes back to my own thoughts. So, yeah, the Wendigo is a metaphor for the opioid crisis and drug addiction. It gets hungrier the more you feed it. It gradually transforms you, takes away all that you were, and you rely on others to take care of you. Now, let's see. So, yeah, easily one of the worst things that this movie could have done is to have the monster not mean anything, to have it just be a monster, not represent something, and then have a bunch of white people come in and save the helpless natives from their monster. But ultimately, the movie does have white people saving the day. Native people barely appear, not at all as characters with depth, and it ends up being misery porn. An argument could be made that that is even worse. And, yeah, those were all of my thoughts. So... So, uh, I almost read out the stage direction. Let me know in the comments what is your favorite movie that is like this. You know, I've mentioned some, you know, some of what I would change for to make the movie better. Do you have any ideas? Do you think there should be a sequel to this where Paul goes, you know... Do you think, if, if this movie is like Mimic, do you think they should make a Mimic 2? Where the, you know, the evil thing is on the loose from the start and, con you know, going around trying to, to kill people. I could, I could watch that. I don't think it would be a good movie, but I could, that, that might be fun to watch for sure. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it's, 
the heart of a Wendigo, there should be a link to my main channel page, one or more links to stuff like relevant playlists. I suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler-filled thoughts on the most recent episode of the Disney Plus show, Willow. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch my own next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.